All right, we're going. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing pretty good. Good to meet you, man. Glad you're. Thanks for coming on. Excited to talk because this has been. Uh, I honestly, when I saw your book, it was like I was kind of like, hell yeah! Let's. I'm so glad there's a book to read about this because it's something that I've been uh, thinking about for a while, but I've never really, you know, dove into of like. Uh, you know, I know what an algorithm is, sort of. Everyone's kind of heard the term, right? It's tossed around all the time, but uh, I, I didn't know how to dive into it. But luckily, you wrote the book on it. Yeah, well, I've, I've tried to write the book to, to to let people understand something that they're dealing with every day, but may not understand as well as they should. And also because I think... Um, I think there's a, a generic uh, misunderstanding of, of some things that algorithms do uh, in terms of uh, modeling reality in a very simplifying way. And I, I, I kind of wanted to reveal that a little bit because I think sometimes things get lost in the in the techno babble. And I was trying to get around that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished, I think. I, your book was great. It was, uh, well, we should, let's, let's say the title for people listening. Uh, Rage Inside the Machine, The Prejudice of Algorithms and How to Stop the Internet Making Bigots of Us All. That's great title, and the <laughs> subtitle is scary as hell. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I was going for, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, no. yeah, I mean, you know, I think that that certainly uh, the way that we look at each other through the internet is very simplifying, and I think when you simplify the way you look at other people, you're you're on well on the road to, to possibly judging them in an intolerant way. So, and I think history kind of shows that, so I was kind of trying to dis- discuss that in the book, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the cool thing is you go through like the whole history of everything, which which was awesome. I had no idea yeah. that that was even going to be in the book, but it was fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I like um, I like placing technological and scientific concepts in historical context because I think it's pretty rare that we think about that. And I think at fundamentally at the, at the at the base of all of this is the fact that we think that science and mathematics are completely objective views of the world. But in reality, science and mathematics are usually uh, representing the world in a simplified way. When that's about people, then you get into trouble. And um, the fact that that hard, cold facts sometimes aren't as hard and cold as we seem they are, seem as we think they are, is one of the things I'm trying to get at in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So yeah, so we'll dive into all that. Um, I think maybe a good or kind of a... uh, not necessarily, I want to say fun, but fun's not the right word, but a good place to start, I think, is kind of with some of the, uh, the you know, easy examples that you kind of give in your book of like the Twitter, the racist Twitter bot and stuff like that. Can you give yeah, me some yeah, of those? Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, there's, a, there's a ton of them and we see them more kind of every day. Uh, a, a really famous one from a, years, a few years ago is if you put um, the terms unprofessional hair into a Google image search, you get pictures of black women. Uh, and, uh, that was discovered, uh, quite a few years ago, but it's become even more true ironically. And this is kind of an illustration of the kind of feedback loops that exist in in the internet is that because a story was written about this in prominent newspapers, and then people picked it up and wrote stories about the story and stories about the story about the story. And they always featured pictures of black women in, in the thing. So now it's even more true because when you look at unprofessional hair, you're now referring to that story, which has pictures of black women. So you still get more pictures of black women as, as the illustration of what unprofessional hair is. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's a great illustration. Uh, another one is, um, famously, um, y- it used to be that if you typed the words are a R E Jews, and the uh, Google auto suggests the number one Google auto suggests for a long, long time was evil. Are Jews evil? Uh, and funnily enough, wow. are women evil was another one. And um, and you get I, I tell you this has been the gift that keeps on giving. When I give talks, um, uh, I, I would go to different parts of the UK and I'd, I'd put in the uh, the local people's name in the Google search. And like um, I gave a talk up around Liverpool and. Um, Scousers is what we call people from Liverpool. That's a, not a pejorative. It's a, it's a name that, that they, they use. Liver, liver, little, Liverpudlians or Scousers is the, is the way you refer to um, people from Liverpool. And if you put in our Scousers, it says our, our Scousers thieves was the number one Google suggest. And, and then um, the Welsh, I gave a talk in Wales, it's are the Welsh. And about, you get, you know, you get are they English, a few other things. But then about three, four down, you get uh, inbred. 
<laughs> so this is really the gift that keeps on giving. You, you look for these things and you find them. And, um, wow. and, and, you know, there's a reason for that is that the kind of things we, that somebody has put that, that question into Google, Google is trying to identify simple phrases that can be turned into searches reliably. And that's mm-hmm. how autosuggest works. It's not coming up with complex things because it can't, it's not, tr- they're rare. So it's coming up with simple worded phrases and, and things that like that simple descriptions of people come out and often times those are intolerant. Uh, there's tons of them. There's um, Google image search labeling a black couple as gorillas is a really famous one. And, um, and they keep coming out all the time because effectively um, at the core, uh, AI doesn't understand things in a deep way. It understands in a very simple way. And when you, when you talk about people in a simple way, you end up saying probably things that, that aren't, um, aren't appreciative of the complexity of people that really exist. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. I mean, is that kind of the, the fundamental issue of, of algorithms is they just, they simplify too much? Uh, well, I, I think that, yes, uh, I think that the, the kind of intelligence that AI has is of a very mechanistic kind. And it, the appreciation of subtlety and complexity is something that is very difficult for AI and, and maybe out of its reach entirely. It's something we're very good at and um, as people. And um, when you, if you look at the history of science, quantitative social science, dealing with people in a, in a way that's about numbers and measures uh, and categories uh, and generalizations, all of those things have always been useful for science, but right at the border of intolerant thinking about people. It's not uncommon at all. And we've always had to have reflection on this because when you reduce people down to a number, you very dangerously place, you know, you're very near the danger of placing people into, into categories that aren't very uh, appreciative of their complexity. And we, we know this, but now that our infrastructure is algorithmic and algorithms are only capable of that kind of quantitative and categorical thinking, uh, then we've got a situation where these semi-autonomous entities can then make those kind of decisions themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's, so the, the mediation that's necessary to keep science from turning into intolerance is less available. And, and that's the thing that I was trying to get at in the book is to say, you know, now we're letting the algorithms loose. They think quantitatively about people. Uh, that's all they can do. And, and therefore these, these ills that we've seen historically are going to come up more. And indeed they have. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Man. So, uh, yeah, God, that's, it's just like, uh, it's a, it, for me as an average person, it's like a little bit confusing to, to think about, but I understand what you're saying where it's just, um, they're, they're turning people into numbers kind of, yeah, or, yeah. Or, or assigning them categories that they, that a, um, algorithm can understand. But in reality, it's a lot, there's, yeah. there's way more to it than that. Well, you know, a really great example to, to, so people can relate to it is um, in the Biden campaign, uh, one of the things that, that went wrong, apparently, is that, um, and this goes wrong consistently across kind of forms, is people who are identified as Latin, uh, Latin American, uh, are, uh, are very diverse. Uh, the, the Latin American community is a lot of different things. This is the reason you see Latinx used a lot now, is, is it's a lot of different things. If you're doing something like sending out mailings to people or evaluating people on a census form and you've only put in the category Latin American or Hispanic, right, that's all you've put in, then all that subtlety of difference between people is summarized and lost. And any categorical or quantitative thinking about people has the same risk. And in reality, you know, people don't fit into categories well at all. You can describe them categorically, but you've always got to, you know, if you know somebody uh, and know them well, then you know they're not just simply a bunch of labels, you know, a a black, Hispanic, American um, uh, college student. You know, they're much more subtle than that. But forms only appreciate the categories that they've presented. And the same thing is true for algorithms. Algorithms uh, only present only can understand the things that they originally were conceived to uh, appreciate. Now, people who are hardcore AI, AI, AI people who are just saying, ah, but now they're coming up with their own categories. Yes, but in every instance, uh, there is a representational limitation. There, there, is, it, there is something 
that has been limited about the way the algorithm works because they're designed by humans and we have limited ability to, to do AI at this time. You know, it, it, there are limitations on what we're able to do. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there's a lot more in the book than that. I think talk a lot about um, kind of the history of numbers and how they're used to, to describe people and, and things that concern people in a, starting in something like the 17th century or 16th century, I think. So, yeah, it's, there's a lot of stuff in the book. But it's not a, it is a book for everybody. It's, it's a, you know, if you're reading my book and there's any math in it and there is a little, uh, skip it over, skip over it. doesn't matter. You'll still, you'll still get the mm -hmm. point. The, the math in the book is uh, often offered for irony, often. Like, oh, you know, it's often in there ironically right. rather than for you to really study it hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I guess one of the, this, I think this is an example of kind of, you know, reducing people to, to like a quantitative uh, measurement would be the IQ test, right? Exactly. It's one of the prototypical uh, kind of um, prototypical examples of how people got reduced. And, and it, it has many of its roots in the eugenics movement and in, in intolerance. Uh, the, the advancement of the IQ test, it's interesting, the IQ test was, it was invented by a man who, who basically had the right attitude. He said, look, what this is for is it's not a, it's not a great measure of general intelligence, but it is good for identifying people who are way out on one end and, and giving them more help. He was really trying mm -hmm. to help French school children who needed more help get it. And that's what his goal was. And he, he spent his whole life and his partner spent his whole life basically trying to uh, dissuade people from using it as a as more of an instrument to measure intelligence in general. Because when you take a complex phenomena like intelligence and you summarize it down to one number, or even a few numbers, or even a few categories, uh, you, you're inherently doing something that that is dangerous. But the history of the IQ test is basically to use it as a very blunt instrument to describe people and sometimes do some very awful things to them, uh, both socially uh, and even physically. Um, you know, people were being identified by IQ test um, and sterilized. You know into the 1960s, you know, it, you know, so, and, and of course, all of this thinking uh, was very associated with the eugenics movement and the idea that people sh people's uh, life and breeding should be controlled in order to better humanity. So all of these things have uh, really ugly roots, but uh, the IQ test, uh, other little things about it is, is um, they found out after they put in the first IQ test that women did a lot better than they expected. Women in general were doing well, girls were doing better than boys, so they changed mm -hmm. the test. <laughs> so they just changed the test, and uh, and they added more questions about things like sports. Sure, uh, <laughs> so it's it's really quite shocking. And you know, hey, look, I went to gifted school in Alabama because I I did well in the IQ test, and and you know that was a formative, life changing experience for me, and I'm sort of glad it happened. But the thing is, is um, it's not that it's a useless instrument; it's just a blunt instrument. And blunt instruments can be useful for things, right? Just don't use them for things that require fine work. And mm. uh, don't use them to make sweeping assumptions about humanity, um, as has been done in books writing about, particularly the bell curve, um, uh, Murray's bell curve book, uh, uh, you know, kind of saying that the, bell cur the, the IQ test is predictive of lots and lots of stuff and kind of correlated to things like race which is rubbish because the, the IQ test is, is a extraordinarily rough measure. And of course it correlates to all sorts of other things. You know, there's such a thing as cross correlation is, is like the fact that this test correlates to other tests that kids have to take in school says something about test. It doesn't say, some, say something about children. Right. Mm -hmm. And the life and the tests that then life presents are thoroughly indoctrinated in that quantitative view as well. So the fact that that correlates the IQ test is unsurprising. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's a real measure of, of intelligence. And anybody who has day-to-day -day experience of people knows this, right? If, you, if, you've, if you've experienced broad experience of people, there are a lot of people who maybe are not good at uh, school or, or test or things like that, but are deeply wise and intelligent. And we all know that, you know, people, people are sen sensitive people know this, but algorithms don't. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, that was like kind of the example that really helped me to understand um, kind of how algorithms work. Because that is that an appropriate way to look at it where, you know, that what the IQ test does 
you know, where you take a test and then it, it assigns you an intelligence number. That's what algorithms are doing behind the scenes, sort of? Uh, that, so that's quantification. And they're also doing categorization. One of the things that uh, is an outgrowth of the uh, IQ test is um, there was an American eugenicist who used it to, he, he took the IQ, if you think about the bell curve in space and you think about kind of dry, divide, dividing it into some quadrants, he basically put labels on each of them, and, and some of those ad- labels included idiot, imbecile, moron, which is where right. he invented. Uh, and I'm trying to remember this guy's name. It's freezing on me, on me for a minute. But the IQ test was the word moron is an outcome of categorizing based on the. So the first you quantify, and then you categorize. Then you place people in categories. And isn't it ironic, and this is something I, I think about a lot, is um, in a time where people are trying to decategorize the way they explain themselves, where we have people who now are non-binary is something that's come up. Uh, the idea of people, ta- mixed race people, not, you know, not identifying as black or white or anything, identifying as mixed. In this time when people are beginning to decategorize themselves, we're instantiating an infrastructure, um, an algorithmic infrastructure in the world that's all about quantification and categorization. So those two yeah. things run counter to one another in a, in a huge way. And um, I think that this is a sign of a real revolution in thinking about people. I think that people, uh, sometimes to have a revolution, you need to identify both sides, you know, who's on which side of, of the fence. And uh, algorithmic quantitative thinking about people is on one side of the fence, and uh, people basically trying to say, look, we're, we're less, co- you know, we're less um, simplified than, than easy categories is the other side. And what we need now is for that clash to occur and then for a consensus to, to occur of a new kind. So what would that new kind be? I think that um, what I really would love for the outcome of the book to be is for people to realize um, that quantitative thinking has its place, uh, even in the examination of people, but that it always has to be checked with the idea that we are human beings, that we are complicated, that we have to make complex moral decisions about one another and about politics and about how we want to live. And that those, the reduction of those just to numbers is uh, inherently harmful. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a guy who writes computer programs, man. I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for quantitative stuff. Uh, it's just that it needs to be placed in its place. Uh, and, and people need to, when they make a final decision about human beings, that needs to be a human decision, not a, not a quantitative decision. We know this, you know, uh, if you think about the law as an algorithm, you think about, you know, the, the written law as an algorithm, um, and it is. It's a set of rules, or procedures we're supposed to go through of evaluating the evidence and and uh, and uh, saying what a punishment should be for a particular crime. It's a system, right? Um, we know from hundreds of years ago that the law is a blunt instrument. And what we did to overcome that is we have judges and juries. We have human beings who make the final empathetic moral decision. Right. And... Um, you know, as algorithms begin to become a part of the legal system as for policing, for determining whether someone gets probation, determining sentencing, uh, you know, predicting recidivism, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we need to remember that. Remember that when we founded countries and legal systems that we inserted a jury of one's peers or a, or a qualified meritocratic judge um, who, ever, who the community have voted as a good person as a way to make that system not blunt. And we need to continue that kind of thinking in, in our thoughts about how algorithms in our, in our society as well. I see. That makes sense. That's, I like that example. That That's really good. Cause yeah, it's, there are like the structured rules, but then there is somebody who is a human who can, you know, pull all these other things together and actually make the decision. That's sure. I really absolutely. like that. Yeah. Cool. Um, but that's a good point. Like something, can you kind of maybe give a few more examples or elaborate on how, where people, where we algorithms may be influencing us in our lives and we don't even realize it? Sure. Um, I brought up some of the judicial examples, uh, you know, uh, predictive policing a- a- algorithms that tell police, well, you should run your patrol over here. You, you should try to patrol more in this area. 
Uh, yeah. Typically what that's going to do, if you're looking at crime statistics and things like that, it's going to put more police in areas of poverty, right? Undoubtedly. And, and then there's going to be a, in, in our society, in, in American society, there's going to be a correlation of that to race. So black people are going to be policed more than white people. Now that's a feedback loop. And, and the way to break that loop is to realize, you know, that's not the right thing to do. And, and it's not all about policing. It's about the community and things like that. That's the right way to break that. Um, mm-hmm. In judges getting recommendations based on da- big data to say, is this person likely to reoffend, um, you know, for probation or for sentencing? You know, these are other ways they've, they've entered. Um, evaluating people for loans. Should you give someone a loan or not? Uh, you know, and, and the same sort of feedback loops exist. Failure on loans correlated to poverty and then correlated to race. And all of these things occur and we have to counter those actively, right? Because we don't, we don't counter those actively. The social feedback loop is going to reinforce traditional prejudices and traditional categorizations of communities as being, uh, you know, fit or unfit. So, so, you know, that, that's, those are ways that algorithms are entering our lives. And, and certainly, those, those kind of things entered our lives before algorithms. It's just that now it's in a black box that runs really, really fast. And so if we're not aware of that, then we're liable to do um, repeat terrible mistakes of the past. Mm-hmm. And then um, can you tell me about the, uh, the Chinese social scoring system that, that's going on? Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this is, I haven't checked on this in the last year or so, but one of the things that was going on in on mainland China is uh, they put in this social scoring system where you get uh, positive points for being a good citizen and negative points for 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 doing things like I don't know littering you know or, or committing a crime or something like that and and ultimately the system can be gathered from big data about you so you can basically you know they're gathering big data and say oh is this person giving to charity is this person volunteering their time is this person uh, a frequent litterer, et cetera. And you get a score. And then that score determines things like, can you shop in certain shops? Or can you get extra points towards tra- to, towards being allowed to take a trip that you may not be allowed to take otherwise? Uh, do you have access to uh, other social services more easily than others? Because you get a high score, you might say, Get to, get to jump the queue in a social service of some kind. So, if, so effectively, it's a citizenship score, but it's all run from big data. It could be it could be plugged into things like facial recognition and things like that, so that effectively cameras are monitoring how you're behaving. So, so uh, and and the funny thing is, um, the Chinese populace have been largely uh, endorsing of this. They basically said, "Yeah, you know, we're all for this. This is great. We're going to get you know really." This, so, oh yeah, because you know it's a different it's a different society from from the society in America, uh, and I think that that they they see things differently. Uh, that's not to judge. I mean, the, the the thing is, is that in my mind, it's not the fact that the government decides, hey, you get special citizenship points for being a good citizen. That's not the. I mean, that's hey, that's a difference of the way we run our governments, right? That the thing that bothers me is the fact that it's hooked into quantitative algorithms that are evaluating you all the time and that the correlation effects to things like community or, um, or you know, you live in a rough neighborhood, you behave differently than if you don't live in a rough neighborhood, right? You know, the, sure. the, you know people have to do different things depending on how they live. And you get these feedback loops, just like in the justice examples I provided. And then, you know, you'll end up enforcing prejudices. And I really believe that any system like that that isn't mediated by people in making judgments about those kind of things for people is going to, is liable to do that. Yeah. I mean, the, mm-hmm. yeah, like the idea sounds good, like good intentions there and stuff like, you know, cool, but it just seems like there's, it so easily could go wrong. Indeed. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm all about people thinking twice uh, about things and, and um we so need, you know, if anything this last year has taught us is um, human beings interacting with other human beings in a human way is so very important. And when we isolate ourselves more and more behind 140 characters or um, uh, a, a system that, that offers us friends based on some al- analysis that ultimately is serving some corporate purpose, you know, we, we lose something really quite profound. And I think, uh, you know, that, that kind of human touch 
uh, you know, um, one of the things we've really seen over the, over COVID is this, is the people we reward uh, most in our society uh, may not be the right people, because think of the heroes that we've had over the past year. And those are some of the worst paid people in society. Teachers, yeah. nurses, you know, um, you know, our systems of, of valuing people, of assigning quantity to people's value, uh, aren't very good. They're not. Uh, things that are of real value have been undervalued. And I think we can all see that now. And um, hopefully that means that people will reevaluate quantitative evaluations of, of people in general. I mean, it, you know, the marketplace determines, you know, Americans believe that the marketplace should determine value. Um, the thing is, is that that don't work. I mean, you know, it, it's great for some things, you know, hey, it works some of the time. Doesn't work for everything. I mean, the people who educate our children are paid terribly. You know, mm-hmm. how is that? How does that make sense in our society? You know, how does that make sense? Um, and um, anyway, I, 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 I've, I've diverged into a rant there. Forgive me. No, no, I get you. But I mean, is that kind of kind of brings up a point of like, is that our algorithms kind of uh, what's the word um, emphasizing, I guess, pre-existing beliefs or prejudices in, a- in absolutely. humans? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and I mean, one of the things I guess I was alluding to there is uh, we have a one of the ways we have a quantitative view of human interaction is through the science of economics. Um, economics became a quantitative science uh, back in the 18th century and became highly quantitative. It uh, is very useful. I, I'm, I'm not putting down economics. Economics is very useful. However, it does simplify, reduce, and quantify everything and treat everything as if it can be acted on quantitatively. On top of that, because of our survival of the fittest view of evolution, you combine those two things together and you get the kind of um, market-driven uh, philosophy of, of, of how uh, basically people interacting in a largely greedy way should lead to the best possible outcomes overall, best social outcomes overall, which is not, a, is not wrong all the time, but isn't right all the time either. And mm-hmm. uh, that, that view... Um, is directly tied to the way that we think about algorithms. The, the, why, the idea of interactive, quantitative, uh, survival of the fittest uh, type interaction. You know, um, the, the thinking, I suppose, on the internet is, is that, um, in social media, is that serving you what you most vote for uh, with your clicks, with your dollar votes through clicks, is what you want and what you need. Uh, and that's not necessarily true. I think that we can make judgments about what's good for society and give people things that they, uh, you know, that they didn't expect that will be really great for society and great for them. And I think the intensification, that, uh, that the connection here, the economic connection is that that largely our media system now is driven by advertising. It's driven by commerce, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's not driven by values. It's driven by commerce. And we see how that's turned out. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's manifest that we've had the most polarized society of, you know, I think in memory, uh, certainly mm-hmm. in memory, possibly in history. And um, part of that is the dynamics of basically serving people information uh, in order to basically make the most money out of that information, and we used to right. know this. We we knew this back when I was when I was a kid in the seventies. Um, you know, there was a much less commercialized news media, particularly broadcast media, was much less commercialized than it is now. And uh, the commercialization of media, including now social media, which is highly commercially driven, has has led to um, things that don't work very well. And yet, in and that's now in the social media setting, directly driven by algorithms. Algorithms decide how your newsfeed gets presented, and they're making simplifying assumptions about who you are. And uh, unfortunately, there's a feedback loop, and it drives you more into being who they think you are because you're only seeing news that basically services who they think you are. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's a 
these, these are the kind of things I'm trying to get at to get people to kind of think about and, and then reshape the way things are done. Yeah. Yeah. The social media one, that's like, that's the big one that I think most people are becoming aware of that one where they're just being, you're not seeing everything. You're just being fed what they think you want. Yeah. And, and it's worse. And the thing is, it's worse than that. It's, it's, um, what they th- what the algorithms think you want and then because of the nature of social media and this is something i've worked on with some students is the very nature of social media is that it tends to lock into bubble chambers by itself in the echo chambers by itself filter bubbles by itself i mean it just kind of tends to do that and it's not it's not hard to see this if you think about your the way you get news on social media is like there's a bunch of tubes connecting you to other people who are your friends and you only get things through those tubes and then what happens is uh the algorithm saying okay this thing came down this tube for his friend and he's never looking at that he's never looking at that tube so that tube gets shut off and mm. this other friend that you look at all the time that tube gets promoted and what happens across the entire network is there are tubes behind tubes behind tubes behind tubes and shutting off a friend, friend two degrees separated from you from some other friend is actually limiting what gets to you. Right. So it all eventually just kind of goes whoosh and you get um, you get these bubbles. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the algorithms acting, simplifying you, plus it's the very dynamics of the media itself. It's the way social media dynamics work. Now, the nice thing about that, I suppose, the, the positive message is I think it can be changed. I think it can be changed. And I think the uh, it's great that you say people are aware of it now. I think people really are. I think the social media companies are aware of it. And I think some of them are beginning to think, how can I have a business model that, that works for me as a social media company, but also does something that won't make me a villain, that won't make me the greatest villain of all society, which which I think there's one one particular social media company who we who kind of brand with with great villainy right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think there are people at all of them who are thinking, how can we make this work? And there, I believe there are ways to make it work. There are ways to use algorithms themselves to, to better social effect. But we've first, first we've got to realize why there are negative social effects. And that's, that's why I wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we can, we don't have to eliminate algorithms. Cause I remember back, you know, Instagram, they they didn't even have an algorithm it seemed like because you just got everything based on when it was posted by the people you follow still i guess but uh sure but uh but you're saying there is a way for them to use algorithms i I think so Uh, but a lot of it um yes i think that that algorithms can help but they have to focus on uh to, to do so i think they have to focus on social socially responsible values i mean one of the things about facebook twitter google Uh, etc. is in many ways they're media companies. I mean, I'd say that that Twitter and Facebook are definitely media companies. Google, a lot of Google's functions are that of a media company. They're providers of information. Mm -hmm. And um, social responsibility for media companies is something that we used to emphasize legally in this country, uh, in in the U.S., Um, you know, through the Fairness Doctrine, etc. And that dissolved in the 1980s, actually. And I think we need to have a return to that, the idea that media companies have a social responsibility that they have to fulfill by public mandate. I think that it, I think some of them are moving towards trying to fulfill it through their own corporate action. It's difficult for them because they have to answer to shareholders. Yeah. Um, but I think they should also have to answer to society. And ultimately, that means governmental action, which is a ways off now. It's going to take a long time for that to happen. There's a lot of people who don't want it to happen. Mm-hmm. But but I think uh, if you so so where I'm starting is this: if you have a mandate of social responsibility, then you can start looking at your algorithms and saying, well, how can the algorithms help that social responsibility? Right mm-hmm. now, the only mandate is corporate responsibility, which is ultimately value to shareholders. And with that mandate, you've got to make your algorithm service that. Right. So so it's that shift of thinking to saying there's a social responsibility and algorithms have to be a part of fulfilling that. Now, will they be great at it? They'll be as good at it as they as they can be being the simplifying, quantifying entities that they are. Will you need human beings to ro- watch out for dumb problems they create and uh, polarizations that they create in ways we haven't foreseen? Absolutely. You'll absolutely have to have humans looking at it 
with probably with very new tools, very new scientific tools to look at uh, information propagation and say, hey, is is this healthy? Is is the way yeah. we're seeing information moving around? There, is, is is that healthy or is that is something bad happening? And we'll need people and tools working together to make that happen. Yeah, because that's what I'm curious about is because, you know, they're, they're driven right now to increase profit, which seems pretty straightforward, but what would be some of the, I guess, goals of, of an AI, if it was, you know, government regulated and to, you know, be socially Uh, beneficial? Well, I mean, if we, there are probably lots of new things, but old things like the fairness doctrine really had a, had a, uh, uh, a mandate to basically say people should always be able not be made to, but be able to see both sides of an issue, right? Mm. As as a matter of course, you know, sure. um, equal time for different different points of view, uh, and and you know, people can always shut it off. People can always not look at it, right? But what's going on now is that it never even gets to them, right? It's it's the, you know you, you know if in a social media system, different opinions will not come to you because the pipes are shut down, right? Then they they won't get to you, so. You don't even have the opportunity to see the other point of view. And I do believe in uh, human institutions, and I believe in the idea of journalistic values, and I believe that we can do some of that too. We can say, look, you know, are there people who have verified and ratified that something is fairly presented? You know, and can we badge things to say, look, this has a badge of journalistic excellence? Um you know, and can we serve people that and say, look, this is something that, you know, people you should trust say is trustworthy. And, I, mm-hmm. you know, there's been a breakdown of trust in human institutions in general. That's a part of this whole phenomena. But um, if we're going to say that algorithms have limitations, then what else but human institutions are going to be the things that come in and say, you know, we, we've, we've got to, you know, endorse or certify or ratify that there's good in the world. And I know there's a lot of people out there who, who believe, you know, the media is, is corrupt and, and, you know, sure. Is there corrupt media? Absolutely. Is media full of opinions? Absolutely. Is, uh, the Pulitzer prize a real thing? Yeah. Pulitzer prize, people who wrote Pulitzer prize winning piece of work are good journalists. Mm -hmm. Nobel prize winners are, are people who can really write, you know, uh, you know, um, various awards of excellence in, in journalism are real. And um, places that have no reputation like that and places that do have reputation like that established over many years are different. They're not the same. And, you know, um, having the endorsement of the CDC for a fact is a real thing. And if, if we all degrade to the point of a conspiracy theory where we basically think nothing can be trusted, then the world's in a real big problem. Because let me tell you, I don't understand everything about vaccines. Mm-hmm. I want people who understand everything about vaccines working and telling me what I should know about them, right? I mean, I, you know, I, if I don't have trust in institutions, man, am I in a world hurt? And so are all of us, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of figuring out the 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 trustworthiness the trustworthiness of of sources because uh, it's kind of a it's basically futile for like a for facebook or somebody to decide if if you know a post or article or information is true or false right absolutely if you look at political fact checkers you know um the good ones will have like six categories of truthfulness right and they've Mm -hmm. got human beings figuring out what those six categories are because truth is a very subtle thing i'll give you a really good example is um theresa may the uk prime i live in the uk now and, and Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister, after the election that uh, last put her in, right before before the one that, that she was not the Prime Minister in, um, she said, after the election, she said, 89% of Britons voted for parties that support Brexit. Now, that's true. That's true. 89, because Labour also, Labour supported Brexit at that time, and, and mm. so did as a party platform, because let Brexit had already hap- happened and we were trying to work through the process. And the same thing for the Conservatives. So yeah, 89% of people voted for parties that supported Brexit. That's true, but it's also misleading, because you know nothing like 89% of people supported Brexit. 
right? It's about 50-50. And le- even amongst labor, the fact that they supported Brexit was with caveats. So there's tons of hidden lies in that truth. And um, and that's true of so many. That's just a, an anecdotal illustration of something that, you know, there are so many ways to say things that are factually true, but deeply misleading. And if you look at things like PolitiFact and other fact checkers, you'll find out the number of things that fall into the fully true and fully false category is relatively small. It's always in mm-hmm. that true but misleading or, or, you know, because that's the real nature of of things. And and so, yeah, we, can we have algorithms detect facts? Yeah, we can. Is that going to solve the problem? No, it's not. You know, right. th- that's not the solution because facts can be presented in ways that are highly misleading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so talking about, you know, kind of changing algorithms to, to work towards, you know, socially beneficial things. Are we at a point where, do we understand what algorithms are doing or is it kind of like, like you mentioned before, kind of like a black box where we don't really know what's going on in there. Are we oh, able well, to manipulate? A, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so how do you measure whether, you know, the, the AIs are, a lot of AIs really are black boxes. So how do you measure, let's say in the social network example, and you want to say, look, I want a more healthy distribution of information. How do you measure what that means? And how do you then feed back to algorithms to say, are you accomplishing this goal? Are we seeing people uh, clicking on things they wouldn't normally click on? Coming up with those kind of metrics and coming up with the feedback mechanisms that then help the AI to respond to those metrics and to evolve towards being more healthy, that's the field that I'm really interested in. That, that's the uh, scientific idea that I'm really interested in pursuing. Uh, can it be done? Are there hints about how to go in that direction? Yeah, there definitely are. Uh, is it being done yet? No, I think this is a real field for real research and endeavor in the future. And, I, you know, we... So first you have to decide on your values and then you have to decide on uh, how do you measure things in order to satisfy them and quantify them, ironically. Uh, and then the third thing you got to do is realize that any quantification is a simplification and it's definitely wrong. So you have to keep modifying it. So we're at the uh, identifying our values point of that. You know, identify what values are do we want for society? And I think most people are are deciding, well, it isn't purely information distributed based on profit. I think everybody is aware that's not working. Then the Mm -hmm. next thing is, well, how do we measure, what do we want and how do we measure what's good? And uh, we're not there yet, but I think we can get there. But I want to emphasize, and this, this is where I don't make myself into a liar. I'm talking about quantifying values while talking about the idea that quantified values are a bad thing. Yeah. And the reason I make myself not a liar is this is there's a great quote in my book, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Uh and that's a quote from uh, GEP Box. And the thing is is that I believe that is one of the most profound things ever said. Uh we can come up with useful models. We got to realize they're wrong and they may not stay useful. And that's the reason you need constant vigilance you know, to deal with real human social problems. So yeah, we, let's let's get through the stage and then let's not fool ourselves into thinking when we've algorithmatized all of this, that that's the end. And in fact, that will create problems. There will be new problems that arise from it and we'll have to fix those problems and be constantly adapting because that's what humans do well. Humans mm-hmm. adapt to this uncertain, chaotic, uh, evolving, complex world of... Uh, side effects and failures and trial and error. We do that really well. And that's where mm-hmm. we need to apply ourselves. Yeah. Right. I see like it, it just kind of in my own experience, a lot of, uh, a lot of frustration with, you know, just kind of uh, communicating ideas to people and just, you know, miss misunderstandings and stuff like that. And, you know, arguments or debates I'll have with people are kind of end up being over like, kind of a label of something, uh, you know, and maybe we define that label quite differently. Um, so it seems like, like, are we ever going to get to a point where, you know, we, we don't even have to talk anymore or something and all of our, all of everything that we mean to say to somebody is just being being to somebody and these algorithms can take all that well, and everything. Um, I wish I had the citation for it, but I read a, a great article on this that basically said um, that if we, we can ever talk to brain to brain, that will not be the solution to any problems. 
Oh. Because the, the nature of communication is while you're, while I'm talking, I'm figuring out what my words mean in context with you. And I'm listening to what you say, and that's making me rethink what I'm thinking. And some of that is about the failures and limitations of language is that I'll use words that possibly aren't exactly the correct word because the, the, the complexity of what I mean is, is, um, is difficult. That process, that evolving process of language is part of communication. And brain to brain, uh, I think that we'll miss opportunities to basically explore right? To, to mm-hmm. explore through failure and through through misunderstanding and things like that. that. That's a real opportunity to explore. Brain to brain, we'll, we'll understand the immediate of what we have. Uh, it, it, the limitations of language are a strength. That's what I really am saying is, is that, hmm. you know, when, I, when, we re, when you and I run into something in this conversation that we can't get right, quite the right words for, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity, and we wouldn't get there without the fact that language is limited. Yeah, right? you know that that's the, the where you get to describing something that um, where meaning is hard to come by. Right? right? What do you mean? It's hard to come by. That's that's the that's the point where real. And if if we skip that step and we just communicate brain to brain, and we're not like falling over ourselves trying to understand what we're saying. I think there's a loss there. I think there's a loss. So. Uh, thank God we have to kind of communicate this way because I think if you think about great debates, great debates aren't about one guy winning, another guy winning. Great debates are about um, the evolution of understanding through the exchange of different views. Okay. That's interesting. That That's a really good perspective because I had always, I, 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 I'm glad you said that because I had always just thought, yeah, once we get there, things will be great. We'll all be clear and we'll understand each other exactly what we're trying to convey. Yeah. You know. Well, I hope no one ever understands me uh, perfectly because doesn't isn't that being rendered boring? That's the other thing about mind to mind communication is won't everything just be so fucking dull? You mm-hmm. know, uh, I mean, you know, um, the great thing about falling in love with somebody really is is not understanding them. Right. It's not understanding them because if, if you understood them fully, you know, where's where's the where's the remaining adventure? You know, where, where's the opportunity? And um, so, yeah, I, I think um, brain to brain communication, uh, the, the, you know, I, I could go on about this, but it, the the removal of the symbolic block, you know, it's like uh, symbols like words. Words are symbols for thoughts. Symbols have limitations. If, if we remove that limitation, I think then we, we end up in a place where um, we don't have this opportunity for kind of figuring things out. And, and yeah. figuring things out is, is the real goal, you know? Right. So, yeah. Man, very cool. Um, I wanted to ask about or talk about, because you, you talk about this in your book, and, you know, we, we're using terms like algorithms and AI, artificial intelligence. Are we, is it even possible, do you think, are we going to get to the point where, artificial intelligence replicates the human brain? Um, all right. I, there's, there's a lot to this. Uh, mm-hmm. The first thing is we, we all think that all our thinking resides in our brain. And I would say that it doesn't. I think that our thinking is, is a whole body experience. You're, um, the oldest brain in your body is in your gut. You know, guts came first. And there is a nervous system in your gut, and that nervous system operates kind of semi-autonomously along with your brain. You don't think about digestion, and you don't think about uh, the tensions that arise in your gut that are reflective of deep, uh, primitive feelings. But they were influence mm-hmm. your thinking. So your immune system is similar. Your peripheral nervous system is similar. These old brains influence your brain. And that stuff's super highly interactive. And on top of that, the kind of model of our brains we have that it's a bunch of synapses firing like a computer, uh, that's not correct really either. That's a high simplification. Our brain does all, the neurons do all sorts of complicated stuff, some of which are like on-offs like firing and some of which are are gradual knobs that turn up and down. So it's all really very complicated. So then you become, you ask yourself the question, can you create a computer system that simulates all of those things to, to simulate? human-like thinking, right? You know, human-like thinking that isn't just 
ones and zeros and isn't just facts and is, is a combination of emotions and feelings and facts and sociality and lots of stuff that allows us to make decisions. And the answer to that is maybe, maybe we can do that. Um, we're not trying to do that right now and we're really, really far from doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you get, does it require us to get to a level of um, replication of, of human beings that's sort of absurd? You know, where, where effectively you have uh, a, a detailed replication of the neuron patterns of a brain and a detailed replica that has to go down to the kind of biological cell level. So we have to make it in wetware. We can't make it in hardware because otherwise it doesn't really work the way it's supposed to. And then you've got to connect it up to a gut and connect it up to eyes and nose and mouth. And that the, the subtleties of those things become a part of the whole process. And, and, and at some point, does this just become a reduction to the absurd is we're basically just making another per people another person and we know how to do that already right um uh, we make plenty of them. yeah um so, so so the thing is is can we get a computer to think like a person uh totally artificial general intelligence is what people refer to uh in general and i would say mm -hmm. not really because um i think that at some point you're really just making another person because i think intelligence human intelligence is not just residing in the brain Mm, okay, I see. Yeah. And that was great. Yeah, I, I really love learning about that because that's something that I have always thought that, you know, I, that's what I thought AI was. That's what artificial intelligence was. But it's, that's, yeah, general intelligence, like you're saying, there's other levels of it, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I make this, I say this thing over and over again, uh, but it, it, is, it is a good example. Is The word artificial means two things in English, and this is really telling. Uh, one of them is in the sense of artificial light. The light from the lamp that's shining in my face is artificial light. It's man-made light, but it is light. It's photons in space. It's light. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. man-made. The other meaning of artificial is like artificial flowers. Artificial flowers are not flowers. They're just an imitation, an appearance of flowers. Mm. That is... Those two meanings cause confusion in the description of artificial intelligence. And you build on top of it that the word intelligence, we don't know what that means, right? We don't, it's a loaded word that we don't really understand. So you have these, this real ambiguity. I think that most AI, what most people re don't realize is most AI is in the realm of artificial flowers. It's, it's an imitation that has some of the appearances of being intelligence like a person, but actually is dramatically different under the hood, made of very different stuff and, and, and limited in its simulation in very profound ways. Mm -hmm. The existence of artificial intelligence like artificial light, where it is intelligence, whatever the hell that means, except man-made, uh, that's, we're nowhere near that. And I'm not even sure we know how to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the thing where, you know, we always kind of are going to need to have humans uh, intervening in working with algorithms. We can't ever really just leave them to themselves. I don't think so, because I think human, particularly when they deal with human problems, right? And, and most of the things we care about are human problems. Look, if, if, you, if you're classifying bolts coming off of the assembly line, uh, hey, man, AI that all day long, as long as up to the point where that bolt gets put onto something that I've got to fly in. Right. Sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah. but when you're when you're making judgments about human beings, about um, how we how we treat them economically, how we treat them uh, uh, in healthcare, how we treat them in the justice system, when you're making those kind of decisions about human beings realize that that where you, you're using that blunt quantitative instrument and you really need a human in there to soften that blow uh, and and not just out of some sense of compassion but out of a sense of the fact that moral questions about people are really complicated really complicated and all of us all adults eventually run into this right you, you run into the idea that that you know yeah somebody did something wrong but, you know, you need to forgive, you know, you know, you don't just punish bluntly, you, you, you forgive and you understand. And once again, we're back to that idea of understanding is um, it's interesting, understanding the, the word, the sense of under in understanding is not beneath, it's within, right? It, the etymology is it's to stand within, like it's not to stand beneath, understanding, it's understanding to stand within, uh, that, that, that's what it, the, the etymology comes from. And, and, you know, gaining understanding is not about uh, creating 
something that's above us, right? Like a, a, a system of AI that basically sits above us and does all this rational thinking and we stand under it. It's about standing within. It's standing within human decision, standing within those things that are quantitative, those things that are qualitative, and, and, and coming to a, a greater understanding. And I know I begin to sound like a bit of a guru on some of this stuff, but I, I don't think, I think this is science. I don't think this is guruism. I think that, that effectively understanding that humans are very, very complex and not reduced quantities easily is, an access, is, a, is understanding complexity science about people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's applied complexity science. Man, Rob, I, I'm so glad we connected and I found your book and everything because you've just, you've answered so many questions that I've always kind of been, that have been in the back of my mind, but I've never really thought about that much. So it's it's super fun to talk to you. It's um, really fun to talk to you too. I, you had some great questions and I, 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 I know I go on a bit, but it's, I'm really passionate about my material, you know. No, it, it comes across and I love it because it brings up stuff that I, I've kind of gone maybe one or two layers deep and then you you hold my hand and make me dive down a little deeper. I like it. Oh, awesome, Travis. Thank you. That's so complimentary. Thank you. Um, and I, I think we should kind of finish on, we on you know, we talked about kind of a potential solutions to this being the governmental regulations, but is there anything that somebody listening can start to do themselves in their daily life of like to, you know protect themselves against these things we've all warned about and talked about for the past hour? It's, you know, giving talks about this stuff, some of the best feedback I've gotten is when I, after I give a good talk, somebody walk to me afterwards and say, this is just like something that's happening in my work. At my work, they're trying to put in this system that that basically is supposed to, you know, uh, measure everything and judge everybody's work or, or, or make a decision. And I'm trying to tell them that something's wrong there. I think that those people, those people who are basically seeing quantification creep in in bad ways here and there, I hope that I give them a way to speak up better, to basically say, look, people don't reduce to quantities easily. They don't reduce to categories easily. And when we've done that before in the past, it's done bad stuff. So what we need to do here is understand where to put the quantitative system and understand where to put the qualitative system. And if I can get people making that argument not uh, and I tell you, making that argument with others, but also even with themselves. When you get stuff served from the internet, remember that it doesn't really understand you fully, and it doesn't understand other people fully. And use it as a tool, but understand its limitations. And if we all kind of do that, that's the gra- grassroots action. And I'll say, you know, um, you know, on the informational front, what that says is. Strive to find information that we wouldn't norm- normally look for, right? You know, or mm-hmm. normally be served. You know, go listen to the other side more um, and try to find the moderate voice in the other side. You know, it's really easy nowadays to find the extremist voice on the other mm-hmm. side. Try, for, if you're a progressive, try to find some moderate conservative voices. And, and it's amazing, you know, people who I, you know, the National Review, when I was a kid, the National Review was, was this arch conservative magazine that progressives would never look at. Now it's moderate because the extremes are so great. Go read the National Review if you're a progressive or, or, or if, you're, if, you're a, uh, if, if you're a conservative, go read some articles in Mother Jones. It won't hurt you, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you'll learn something new and, and try to open your mind to them. So these are the ways we can smooth off the, the hard quantitative algorithmic edge that is stabbing into all of us uh, all the time, you know, and if we can do that, we'll be making the world, world a better place in a small way. Yeah, cool. No, I think that's very helpful. Um, man, well, Rob, let's tell people about where they can get your book, uh, your website, anywhere you want to send people. Yeah, uh, well, I, if you want to find stuff about the book, uh, it's rageinsidethemachine.com, one word, rageinsidethemachine.com. Uh, if you can buy the book at all the normal venues, uh, uh, you know, basically anywhere you can find a book, it's available in audio, it's available in Kindle. And, um, and you know, if you do read it, you can follow me on Twitter at, uh, it's at D-R-R-E Smith, at Dr. R-E Smith, D-R-R-E-S-M-I-T-H. And if you want to follow me there, uh, please do. And if you read the book and enjoy it, please uh, drop me a note or something or, or put an Amazon review up or something like that just so I kind of learn something from you. 
Very cool. Well, yeah, for people listening, I'll have links to all that stuff in the description for them to click on easily, check you out on Twitter and everything. But uh, yeah, seriously, thanks again, Rob. Really, really fun conversation. Thank you for coming on and taking the time. I really enjoyed it too, Travis. Take care.